Good evening uh, and welcome to the T.W. Schultz Memorial Lecture for 2022. I'm Madhu Khanna, President of the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association and Professor in the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Economics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I would like to say a few words about this T.W. Schultz Lecture and Award event. This event was initiated by the AAEA Foundation in 2006 and is now given every year during the AAEA sessions at the ASSA meetings in January. It was established to honor Theodore W. Schultz, who was a past president of the American Economics Association and was named a fellow of the American Farm Economics Association, which is currently the AAEA. He received an extensive variety of awards and honors throughout his career, including six honorary degrees and then went on to receive the Nobel Prize for Economic Science in 1979. A few of his major contributions to economics include his studies on economics, economic growth and human capital, and his extensive work on rural economics and the economics of poverty. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Lisa Schulte Moore as a recipient of the T.W. Schultz Memorial Lecture and Award. Lisa is a professor of natural resource ecology and management and Associate Director of the Bioeconomy Institute at Iowa State University. She conducts cutting edge research on human resource, human landscape interactions and addresses the integration of perennials and other forms of continuous living co cover in agricultural landscapes. Dr. Schulte Moore has published more than 100 scientific and educational articles. She is co-founder of the well-known STRIPS project, which refers to the science-based trials of row crops integrated with prairie strips, which was an innovative project that developed prairie strips conservation practices. She's also lead developer of people and ecosystems and watershed integration, a web-based educational game designed to help people understand human impacts on the environment and improve the management of natural resources. She directs Sea Change, which is a USDA National Institute for Food and Agriculture Sustainable Agricultural Systems Project. Among other honors in 2021, Dr. Schulte Moore was named a MacArthur Fellow and was selected to serve on the agriculture work group of Iowa Governor Kim Reynolds Carbon Sequestration Task Force. We're really thrilled to have her here today. We will hold all questions till the end. Uh, please use the Q&A function to post your questions as they come along, and we will have time at the end for her to answer them. With that, Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Khanna, and thank you for everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, really excited to be here and honored to receive the T.W. Schultz uh, Award and be invited to talk to this esteemed group. I love working with applied economists, so this is a really great opportunity to be able to interact with you all at your professional meeting. I'll share my screen now. You can tell me if you can see that, Maru. Yep, it's working. Okay, awesome. I'll get started and uh, yeah, looking forward to a vibrant discussion uh, after my talk. So uh, talk uh, toward a perennial corn belt, science and stakeholders, landscape and leadership, and talk about my work here in, in the, the corn belt. And let's see, get my slides to advance, there we go, <laughs> here we go. So the big question I'm trying to address in, in my research is how do we feed a growing human population while maintaining a livable planet. Uh, it's one of the grand challenges of our time. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, trying to meet the, the calorie demands, the nutrition demands for a, a growing you know, population, uh, seven point, what are we, eight billion now and headed towards probably, you know, 9.5 or 10 billion. But also we demand many other services from our from our planet that we also need in addition to food. And uh, you know, while this is a global issue, you have to start somewhere. And for me, I start in my home, which is in Iowa, the productive center of the middle of in the middle of the North American continent. And Iowa is very well known uh, globally for our productivity, of course, for corn and soybeans, as well as what we use those things for. So uh, we produce also the most hogs, uh, pork in the, the country, the most eggs, 
and uh, substantial amounts of, of beef, the most ethanol and, and bio products in, in the US, um, which is great. And as something as Iowans we're really proud of um, our supporting uh, the US economy and, and globally in terms of this, this production. But uh, as one of the things that comes along with that high level of productivity is what you applied economists would call call uh, externalities, right? Where um, uh, the way that we've designed the system, we also have challenges in terms of soil loss and, and degradation. And uh, especially because we leave the land bare for so much of, of the year and uh, the water runs off and taking our soil and agricultural chemicals with it and, and uh, ends up impacting our urban areas as well as as far down as the, the Gulf of Mexico. And because we don't have that perennial cover on the landscape allowing the water to infiltrate, agriculture also is, is linked with some of the extreme flooding that we experience. And another uh, concern is loss of habitat for our native biodiversity. So as we look at these challenges as a whole, um, you know, the, the question becomes, okay, so we, we need food production, but we need these other things as well. How do we go about balancing uh, these two things? And really this, this question is, is part and parcel to what so many applied economists do in terms of evaluating trade-offs, especially long-term trade-offs versus short-term trade-offs um, as expressed here in this graphic. But if uh, in my work with agricultural stakeholders, you know, while these things uh, tend to end up as trade-offs when it comes to the pocketbook, really we all want these things, right? And uh, we want to figure out how to how to how agriculture can provide all of these values to society. And so that's really the the focus of my research is how does agricultural provide that full basket of goods and services uh, for society. And I've start, been working on this question since I arrived at Iowa State University. Um, my training is not in applied eco economics, it's in, in uh, landscape ecology, although working with colleagues, I've expanded greatly beyond my initial expertise. And that's been really fun. Um, but you know, that's kind of the way of I, the lens through which I, I look at some of these issues. And so as I came to Iowa State back in 2003, um, you know, this was the landscape that I saw. And the, the thing that really struck me was the homogeneity of that landscape, especially from that lens of a, a landscape ecologist and the fact that so much of the, the land was left bare throughout uh, the, the year. As a new uh, person in this region, one of the really smart things I did was I made a list of all the, uh, the scientists across campus that I wanted to, to talk with and, and learn about the Corn Belt agricultural system. And the, the predominant message that these people shared was that you know, the step one is that we need to add continuous living cover to the landscape. So in here, this picture, you see a, a field with cover crops uh, and in that foreground compared to uh, fields that are, are tilled, sort of the more traditional practice around it. So the question is like, how, do, how is it that this one farmer can plant cover crops, maintain this continuous living cover where those neighbor farmers cannot? You know, what are those barriers? Those were some of the things I sought to answer as well as the spatial questions of, you know, maybe it is, it isn't possible to have a perennial uh, corn belt everywhere, but what portion of the landscape could we make sure to have that perennial cover in and what would be the, the benefits of, of sort of incremental amounts of perennial cover within the landscape? And is there a, a point at which, you know, there's diminishing returns um, as reflected in this in this graphic. And so this was a, a graphic that I penciled my first semester here at Iowa State, looking at uh, I my basic hypothesis, a landscape with low versus high perennial cover and what we could expect in terms of, of the, the environmental benefits associated with those landscapes. We also, the team that I was working on, uh, started working on this with, we also, uh, we also, came up with this other hypothesis, thinking that 
you know, we've got a lot of consolidation, a lot of uh, homogenization in the markets here in the Midwest. And, you know, would there actually be an increase in the socioeconomic benefits as well through increasing this perennial cover? This idea that we're with adding the perennial cover, we're making more efficient use of the land, the sunlight, the nutrients, the water uh, that are our natural resource base, as well as the labor um, that exists here in the in the Midwest. And could there it be possible that we would actually increase to some extent the uh, through the strategic integration of perennials, the socioeconomic benefits as well. So this is the driving hypothesis uh, behind my work here. And I'm gonna talk about how, you know, some of that work here tonight. As a landscape ecologist, uh, focusing on these questions, uh, where I started is what I already know how to, knew how to do, which is looking back at history and trying to understand the dynamics for where we got to the place that we are and um, whether there had been ways that uh, more perennial cover had been inter interjected in the landscape historically. And working with a, a PhD student, Paul Brown, on some of these historical tests of that disproportionate benefit hypothesis, I had really uh, uh, smart and um, entrepreneurial graduate students at the time who not only wanted to study ecology like me, but were very interested in the human dimensions as well. And they connected me with social scientists like Lynn Westfall and natural resource economists like John Tyndall to look at that disproportionate benefits hypothesis from a, from a social standpoint. Worked with uh, a, an array of graduate students and postdoc on looking at, looking at simulations, model tests of the disproportionate benefits hypothesis. And then colleagues across campus here and beyond on actually changing the, the landscape and measuring the impacts of, of strategically integrating perennial vegetation across the landscape. So colleagues from agronomy and, um, and uh, agricultural and biosystems engineering, economics and, and beyond here. Uh, because our time is short, I'm going to focus primarily on one experiment uh, that we've been conducting uh, Actually, the idea of it was, um, uh, the inception point of it was back in 2003, again, my first semester here at Iowa State, um, the STRIPS experiment, the science-based trials of, of row crops integrated with prairie strips. It took us that four years sort of to solidify the idea and get the funding and design the experiment. So we, we implemented that in, in 2007. And this, this timeline is going to be the arc of my talk, uh, so you have a sense of where I'm at in terms of, of the information I'm going to share with you tonight. And I'm going to end up with some lessons learned that hopefully you can take in your work as you think about uh, having impact through, through applied economics research. Upon implementing the, the STRIPS experiment, we collected uh, a, all sorts of data, and I'll talk more about that as well. And also we engaged what we call boundary spanners, people that were engaged here in agriculture and thinking about how science could sort of trickle out on the, on the landscape. That was a part of their job. And that was a really smart thing uh, to do at the, the beginning of a, a project. These people invested in the project and helped us improve it over, over time. So a little bit about the STRIPS-1 experiment. STRIPS-1 uh, research was conducted at Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge, which is just outside of Des Moines, Iowa. And it's research and demonstration on small experimental catchments. Um, here you can see one of our catchments in the, the background of this photo with uh, the darker color being soybean crop and the lighter color being the, the prairie that's integrated in to along the contour within one of these small catchments. And the equipment you see at the base there is blown up at the, the, in the lower right-hand corner. It's a H flume, which allows us to collect all sorts of uh, hydrological and uh, water chemistry and measurements associated with uh, that treatment. When we first started designing this experiment, we knew we wanted to look at perennials and try to address that disproportionate benefits hypothesis. It wasn't clear what perennial cover we would initially um, experiment with, however. 
Um, through a variety of team meetings, we decided to focus on prairie, and there are lots of good reasons to do so. One, it's a perennial cover type, and so it addressed our hypothesis. Also, it has uh, very deep roots, which can help build soil and, and hold it in, in place. Uh, one thing that we recognize a benefit or a function over time that wasn't necessarily clear at the beginning is that the prairie has uh, very stiff stems that stay erect in a pounding rain, which is uh, different than sort of the status quo conservation cover that's used here, uh, brome, which is an exotic cool season grass that leans over in, in rainfall and so doesn't sort of keep uh, things up in the agricultural watershed as well. It's diverse, so it provides habitat to a diverse array of our native biota, and it is native, so our native species are adapted to it, and it's well adapted to our climate and soils. Um, when we started looking for, initially looking for a, a, a research location for putting in this experiment, uh, a lot of people told us that we were crazy, um, and uh, and it's, under, it's easy to understand why we were talking about integrating in a, a native uh, perenni, perennial uh, polyculture into our annual uh, exotic monoculture <laughs> agricultural system. So it's kind of the antithesis of what uh, you know, farmers are typically doing in this, in this region. And so, you know, a lot of the responses that we got when we were looking for an area to perform the research was, you know, what? You're just going to create weed problems for farmers. Um, and, uh, but luckily, the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge uh, saw the value of what we were trying to do and, and connected with it and uh, provided the land base where we could conduct this research. And in terms of the experimental design, um, it was, uh, we had four treatments, the zero being what would be a typical corn soybean ro uh, rotation using no-till soil management. Uh, and then again, we're trying to test the disproportionate benefits hypothesis, as well as looking at strategic integration of the perennial. So we had one treatment that looked at prairie strips, just 10% at the, of the water of the catchment at the base of the catchment another 10% treatment with multiple strips on the contour, and then a 20% uh, prairie strips treatment. The treatments were uh, replicated four times across uh, four, or three times across four different blocks on the refuge. And uh, once we instituted the, uh, the experiment in 2007, we started collecting a, a lot of data from a lot of different uh, for a lot of different um, disciplinary uh, focus areas. And I think that was one of the really key uh, successes of what we have been able to do. Of course, we're looking at crop yield and profitability because uh, that's you know, part and parcel to what agriculture does, uh, really essential to answer those questions. Looking at wildlife diversity and abundance, uh, looking at water qual quantity and quality, soil health and carbon dynamics, uh, pollinators and monarch butterfly. And uh, later in time, we're able to add a willingness, a societal willingness to pay study. And we've been very uh, successful at, at conducting that research and publishing it in the peer review literature over time, supporting you know, students to do that research. And I'm sharing this to kind of help you see what the trajectory is of some you know, long-term um, uh, interdisciplinary studies and, uh, you know, sort of those early publications were more conceptually based. Then we saw uh, publications from the students in terms of theses and dissertations. Those make it out into the peer review literature um, just to kind of see how, how those, uh, that research output changes over time. And of course, it's not just me conducting this research. It's a it's a been a really large and growing and changing group of people over time, and I've tried to capture everyone's name that has contributed to the the research and outreach effort here, just to give you some sense of the the scope of of the team. In terms of results, this is probably the uh, most famous data point uh, that we've collected over time. Um, these pictures were taken in June of 2008 after a four inch rain. 
And, uh, you know, the, the, well, we, the quantitative data we've collected uh, supports these pictures. The pictures really do speak volumes. And so on the left-hand side there, you see one of our catchments that has the 100% row crop treatment. And even though this is no-till, kind of the best of the best soil conservation practice, there was a lot of soil movement after this, this uh, four inch rain, so much so that even some of the corn plants made it into our, into our H flumes. Um, and then one of the treatments that's a 90% crops and 10% prairie, you can still see that there's been soil uh, on the move, uh, but much less than that 100% row crop no-till treatment. And then the, the picture on the, the right was not a part of our experimental design, but was located elsewhere on the refuge, a 100% uh, prairie treatment. And you can see that uh, reconstructed prairie does not, lose, does not lose soil, even under extreme rainfall uh, conditions, as was in this case. This is just one data point. And to, so to kind of summarize our overall results, uh, this we uh, compiled nearly 10 years of data and published it in a paper in 2017 in the proceedings of the National Academy of the United States and uh, comparing our different treatments. And I'll explain this, it's a little complicated, um, but what I want you to see here is that, you know, anything, anytime that one of those bars uh, crosses that, that one line, it means that there's no difference in some different metric. And in this figure, we're looking at 46 different measures that we've taken on those, those experimental catchments. And what you can see here is that when we're looking at the location of prairie strips, whether they be you know, multiple strips along the contour in a catchment or all at the base, there's very few differences. In fact, there's only one difference that we saw um, among the strips versus bottom treatment which is in dissolved phosphorus. We saw more dissolved phosphorus loss in the groundwater in the treatment that had all of the prairie strips at the bottom. We also looked at um, the amount of prairie in the catchments. So go back, Oops. Um, that's the middle one. And again, uh, the main point I want you to see is that there's very few difference bases, differences based on the amount of prairie within the catchment. Um, that again, the dissolved phosphorus measure as well as some of the um, biodiversity measures. Basically, you can pack in more bird territories if you have multiple um, or more, more prairie. But the big difference as we saw was anything between a catchment that had no prairie, the control versus anything with prairie. Um, and we saw this across, across agronomic measures, biological measures and hydrological uh, measures. And so these results are really uh, what started capturing people's attention. To summarize a decade worth of, of research on prairie strips, what we found is that adding 10% prairie strips to this no-till corn and soybean catchments, uh, we see a 37% reduction in the amount of water running off those catchments. So it's infiltrating into the prairie strips and transpire, transpiring up into the atmosphere. Um, we're seeing that there's a 95% reduction in the sediment loss, so we're keeping more soil up in that agricultural catchment as opposed to letting it, uh, uh, losing it from the agricultural environment. We're seeing that there's a 77% uh, reduction in the amount of phosphorus loss through runoff and a 70% uh, reduction in the amount of nitrogen loss through runoff. Those are water quality measures uh, from a, a above ground water quality measures. We also see a change in the below ground, the subsurface water quality measures in that we're seeing a 70% reduction in the loss of nitrogen uh, through subsurface uh, channels, a, a reduction in the concentration. And we're also seeing a reduction in the amount of nitrous oxide emissions from that uh, lower slope position in the catchment. So right above those H flumes. From a wildlife standpoint, we've shown that we can triple the pollinator abundance and double the bird abundance using the catchments. Uh, important to farmers, we found that the influence on crop yield is proportionate to the area put into prairie. So 10% prairie uh, strip treatment, uh, they can expect a 10% change in the yield at that catchment level. We showed that they weren't 
the prairies weren't actually creating weed problems for the farmers, that the prairie strips are cheaper than installing terraces and the costs are comparable to cover crops. That work was done by an applied economist, John Tyndall. And then um, other applied economists, uh, Badri Connell, uh, Karina Schongold, and Tiero uh, Meino uh, from University of Nebraska Lincoln recently did a, a willingness to pay study showing that Iowans are willing to pay for the kinds of benefits that are provided by prairie strips. So those are the research results. Now, how about, uh, you know, what has been the impact of some of those research results? Uh, in about 2012, we started getting questions from farmers about prairie strips. And remember early on, I talked about the boundary spanners that we, had, uh, in, we uh, worked with on our experimental design and in early implementation. These were people that worked for commodity organizations in the state or for, um, for some of the nonprofit environmental organizations, some of the state, uh, the state Iowa Department of Ag and Land Stewardship. Uh, they started seeing the results of our research and say, and talking to farmers they knew and said, you know, hey, you should be looking, you should be looking at what, what's happening here. And, uh, and farmers, lo and behold, uh, were very curious about the data and started uh, visiting our experimental site um, and talking with us about a potential for commercial tests of, of prairie strips. The first farmer that we worked with is shown here, uh, Seth Watkins. He's a farmer down in Southwest Iowa. Um, Seth came to us, I was working uh, on another project with Doug Davenport, shown here on the, the left, who was a NRCS district conservationist at the time. And Doug kept saying to me, hey, you know, what about this Miscanthus bioenergy thing? And I was like, oh, that's a really big lift. How about prairie strips? <laughs> And Doug kept saying Miscanthus, and I kept saying prairie strips. And like finally, at one point, it, it connected. And he's like, you know, I think I, I have a farmer that might be interested in this. And so uh, Doug was a person that introduced us to Seth Watkins. And here we are, the strips team, visiting one of Seth's farms, uh, talking about the potential to put prairie strips on his farm. And by two, that was in 2012. By uh, 2014, uh, we had worked with Seth on a design. He had worked with Pheasants Forever to get funding and seed. And uh, here he is uh, actually planting prairie strips on it, his farm in June of 2014. I'm providing you with some of these dates so you have a sense of for how long uh, some of these changes take. Uh, Seth was the first one. Luckily, he's also a very charismatic farmer that likes to talk about what he's doing. And he started going to farmer meetings and, and talking about prairie strips and saying, yeah, I don't have any data for my farm yet, but you know, it just, it, it feels good to me and it helps me meet my goals for my farm. And that, those messages resonated with others. And so other farmers and farmland owners started coming forward, such as Donna Buell and her farmer. Uh, organic farmer in Northwest Iowa and uh, very concerned about soil loss given the need to uh, maintain that option for cultivation on this farm. Tim Smith, who lives in the Boone River uh, watershed, very concerned about the water that is coming off his farm, ending up in the city of Des Moines where his, his daughter lives and drinks the water and, and pays for the, the water bills and not wanting to be a part of the water quality problem in that area. Uh, the Moore sisters who wanted to honor their mother's legacy on their farmland, uh, her mother was, uh, their mother was always a prairie enthusiast and thinking about how they could honor her legacy with prairie strips on that farmland. Uh, a, uh, a uh, mayor of Cedar Rapids and uh, a, the airport administrator from uh, Cedar Rapids wanting to show that they were using best practices on the farmland around the central Iowa airport uh, to be a model for upstream uh, farmers. An industrialist and um, entrepreneur, Rudy Raislin, who has made his money in the engineering businesses, but is looking to make his, his legacy in conservation, approached us about prairie strips. 
And then also uh, a lot of farmers that were just wanting to do right by the next generation. And this family has always uh, really uh, been touching to me. Uh, Grandpa who planted prairie strips on his farm in uh, April of 2014 with his grandson at his side, looking to pre uh, preserve that soil legacy for two generations on. The things that farmers told us about prairie strips is they saw prairie strips as a practical option to address their goals for their, their farms. I emphasize that word practical because that is about the best compliment you could ever get from a farmer. Uh, they talked about how they don't interfere with spring management on their farm, uh, which is they were all uh, many of the farmers are also looking at cover crops to help uh, achieve some of the same goals, but they're concerned about conflicts of cover crops with their cash crops. Uh, they saw that they didn't see that conflict with prairie strips and they we could help design the prairie strip implementation in a way to minimize uh, the conflict with their tractor movement. And so here you can see uh, what some of these strips implementations have looked like on, on farms over time. In addition to the data that I've shown you and the part that I wanna really emphasize in here is that they're no, not only effective at helping to achieve these goals that farmers wanna achieve on their farms, but they're also beautiful. In about 2015, we had enough prairie strips on commercial farms that we could start, we could move off the refuge and actually start studying prairie strips in this commercial farm environment. We called this the, the STRIPS 2 or research and demonstration uh, project. And yeah, as I said, this is about two, uh, 2015 where we started collecting data on those commercial farms. And uh, this also is a new phase in the project because not only are we collecting data with private uh, landowners and private farmers, uh, but those private landowners and farmers are also helping us to co-create knowledge in terms of the design, how, you know, how to implement prairie strips on commercial farmland. And they're also helping us share the results with their own communities. STRIPS 2 research is ongoing. Uh, key focus is verifying the impacts that we found at that catchment scale on that commercial scale. We also expanded more to do more research on wildlife and honeybees. We were also looking at the opportunity to use prairie strips to retain uh, manure in the agricultural environment and not lose it to our surface water bodies, as well as the antimicrobial resistant genes and organisms that might be associated with manure. So addressing public health concerns, and also a lot more research on long-term and fine-scale soil processes. This research is ongoing, and in the next two years, there's going to be a lot of publication on, on the publications on these four, four topics. I'm not going to go into detail into that uh, because of time, but another key piece I wanted to emphasize is that as we move from that initial ex experiment that was supported by five different institutions to the commercial farm environment, the number of, of uh, partners expanded dramatically. And here you see the partners that are now engaged in some way in the project, whether it be uh, implementing strips, uh, on helping to implement strips on farms themselves, conducting research on prairie strips or funding work or helping in terms of, of uh, disseminating information to various communities. In 2012 and 13, if I would go to a farm audience and asked if anyone had heard of prairie strips, uh, maybe out of an audience of 50, one or two people would raise their hand. Uh, by 2018, that had changed dramatically. Uh, again, the, uh, the, because of the, the number of people involved and also farmers getting out and telling the story themselves. So by 2018, these are data collected by sociologist Jay Arbuckle here at Iowa State. Over 50, about 55% of farmers uh, responded that, to the Iowa uh, Farm and Rural Life Poll survey that they had heard of prairie strips. and. Uh, over 50% uh, has said they either did or might want to learn more about prairie strips or they are or might be interested in having prairie strips on their farms. 
this was really surprising to us. Uh, we didn't expect uh, one, uh, the information to disseminate so quickly or to see this level of interest in prairie strips among the agricultural community so quickly. Remember when we were trying to look for land to implement the experiment initially, we were told we were crazy. <laughs> so having this uh, amount of, of change in that uh, short a period of time, basically, you know, 10 years, just over 10 years um, to us, that was uh, quite a, a rapid period or a rapid pace of, of changing perceptions. And because of the combination of the data uh, the partnerships, the farmers putting prairie strips on their farm and talking about it, those three things together um, meant that, uh, you know, the pol policymakers started showing interest in, in the research as well, and we started to see policy changes. The first change we saw, it, we learned of, was a tribal policy, the Stockbridge Muncie uh, Community Band of Mohican Indians has farmland and they required that prairie strips be a part of any farmland rental contract on, on their lands. Um, that was really cool to see. We were not involved in that those discussions at all. They had seen and heard about the research and, and implemented um, that policy themselves. We were in discussion with representatives from um, uh, the state of Iowa and one of those representatives, David Young at the time, he, uh, uh, he submitted a, place, uh, a farm bill placer bill in 2017 called the Water Quality Conservation Act of 2017. And pieces of this act were inspired uh, by our research. We were also giving lots of talks, including in, in uh, Washington, D.C., and so we were surprised in 2018 when prairie strips were actually listed as a part of the 2018 Farm Bill as now a, a conservation reserve program eligible practice. And then we've been working very closely with the NRCS on a tech note that makes it easier for NRCS to use EQIP funding to implement prairie strips on farmland as well. Again, I want to uh, emphasize that, you know, from our standpoint, the period, the, the pace of change has been quite rapid. If we look at our initial uh, experimental site located here in Iowa, um, over a, about a six year period, uh, either us or partners um, from 2012 to 2018, we worked with uh, farmers and other groups across the, the, the Midwest to start implementing prairie strips on commercial uh, farms. And you can see the location of those farms here with the putting, getting prairie strips uh, in uh, the 2018 farm bill, the, the pace of change has been very rapid. And what you see in this map is the number of acres in prairie strips, the CRP program, in states across the Midwest uh, just since December of 2019 when the CRP policy was actually, actually written. So again, that's a fairly rapid um, pace of change uh, when you think about how long it, it typically takes uh, people in agriculture to think about and implement changes on their farms. And today, uh, we, we know that there are prairie strips implemented through the prairie, uh, the CRP program. There's about 14,000 acres of prairie strips on about 140,000 acres of farmland in 14 states across the US. So uh, that's the story of, of sort of, you know, the uh, many of the changes that got to got me to where I am right now, which is now I've shifted my research focus to look at more market-based approaches to getting prairie and other perennial cover on the landscape. And this uh, shift in focus really has to do with the dialogue that I'm in conversation, that I'm in with uh, the farmers that we're working with, as well as other stakeholders in the region. And many farmers say, you know, CRP is great. Congratulations at having your research have impact. But we would really rather, you know, produce for a, a market um, and not have to be dependent on, a, on government programs. And so the real focus of my work today is potential ways that perennial cover and prairie in particular can, can help pay 
at the at the farm using more Marcus based approaches. And this graph is just to show the multitude of ways uh, my team and I have brainstormed in terms of uh, potential ways this this could work. And of course, one that's uh, a lot of people's minds here uh, in the Midwest right now is is carbon markets. Um, working with the state of Iowa, the Iowa Economic Development Authority, on the potential for um, uh, increasing the credibility of of carbon markets with uh, farming population here in in the Midwest to help. Uh, have carbon markets pay for soil health and, and other practices, such, and practices that encourage it like prairie strips. Uh, we're also looking at uh, the impacts of prairie strips on, on um, pollinator population, including the honey, honey bee, and what happens to honey production when you place a commercial hive out on a, a farm with, with prairie strips. Can, uh, what are the changes to honey bee health and the amount of honey that's produced? And working with the livestock community to look at prairie strips as a potential way to establish grazing corridors uh, throughout uh, row crop agricultural landscapes to help move uh, livestock around the landscape and, and then also um, uh, help with the integration of cover crops into annual agricultural field set. Uh, and the easiest way to make cover crops pay is by grazing them with livestock. And then also looking at the potential for energy production and, and markets and uh, the focus of the USDA NIFA Sustainable Agricultural uh, Systems Project that I, I lead is exactly on this, where we're looking at uh, integrating herbaceous material, both from prairie as well as uh, winter crops in with uh, manure and uh, looking at that pot potential to produce uh, renewable natural gas. And this is incentivized by both the EPA um, RIN low, uh, and the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. And now kind of bringing it all together, um, uh, you know, we talked about the, the need for both uh, the, the agricultural commodity production as well as some of the environmental benefits in agriculture and then also the, the short term and long term and how, 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 how do we help uh, farmers balance those and sort of the work that we're doing and trying to quantify some of the benefits as well as help farmers develop new market markets is really trying to, instead of posing those as trade offs, bring it all together to, so that agriculture can provide a full basket of goods and services for society. And from a science perspective, fully test uh, this, this, fun, this hypothesis that's fundamental to my work, the disproportionate benefits hypothesis looking at perennial cover in the landscape and uh, its relationship to environmental benefits as well as socioeconomic benefits. So I've posed this, uh, this research to you here as somewhat of a straight line, but in actuality, it has been anything but straight. Um, I've learned a lot along the way through collaborations, including collaborations with applied economists and also the farmers and other stakeholders I've worked with along the way. And so rather than straight, the, the line has been much more circuitous. And uh, as we've navigated from uh, a, an initial you know, hypothesis and experimental tests in a more controlled setting to commercial tests out on the landscape. And now uh, looking at these market-based based approaches, from my standpoint, certainly every stage has meant that new skills are, are required and having to be really entrepreneurial about uh, the, the knowledge uh, that I need as a, as a investigator in the space and collaborator in, in this space uh, to keep up with the conversation. And of course, myself, I can't do it all by myself. Um, collaboration is required when you're addressing these really big questions of how to balance food production with supporting our uh, environmental benefits from the landscape. Just four, five key lessons I'd like to share with you as I wrap up, which I think have been really key in allowing my teams and I to be able to conduct this research and have uh, the kinds of success that we have. 
the first of these is that know your people. Um, in the, my case, uh, you know, my people in terms of, of doing this research is, is farmers and really connecting with them on their identity uh, in terms of, of keepers of the land, stewards of the land, as well as uh, the productivist mindset that they're producing uh, goods and services for society. And a key uh, piece of research that's really helped me in terms of navigating that space has been identity theory. So certainly something that comes from the social sciences has really been instrumental to me as I've navigated this space. The second um, piece of lesson uh, I think is really key is to know your role. And from my standpoint, you know, I'm an interdisciplinary scientist. I try my hardest to try to speak from the data and represent the data as, as uh, accurately as I can and also uh, under represent some of the shortcomings of the data, be honest about that in my discussions with stakeholders. And again, one of the key pieces of research that's really helped me in navigating that space uh, come from, comes from political science and is, the, um, is Roger Pilka's work on the honest broker. And so I really try to be down there in the lower right hand uh, corner, an honest broker of policy alternatives. And one of the things about Pilka's work is he says that it's, it's hard for an individual uh, to, be, to be an honest broker. And I would agree with that. And that's part of why you know, teamwork is, makes for dream work. We, we help each other, correct each other, um, really temper each other um, and make the, the work better by working in, in interdisciplinary teams. Uh, thirdly, meet people where they're at. In terms of my stakeholders, uh, it's meeting them with their values for, for their farm. And when we talk about long-term values, those start with the soil. And so trying to always uh, start that communication that we have with farmers uh, from that sort of soil lens, uh, but then also recognizing that different people are at different, uh, at, at different points in their operation and also just their mental mindset as they approach something like a new conservation practice like prairie strips. And so the diffusions of innovation theory um, from Everett Rogers has really been uh, fundamental for me again, as I think about uh, approaching different groups and people and thinking about where they're at uh, on this curve and what kind of information they might need to, to, um, uh, to move forward with uh, potential adoption. Lesson four is reciprocate. If you expect someone to show up for you, <laughs> you have to be willing to show up for them. And so for me, that's meant, you know, sometimes three, three and a half hour drives across, uh, across Iowa to show up at a farmer's field day. Um, because if I want them to, you know, show up to a, a one of uh, my meetings for giving a talk, I need to show up to their their field day and talk to their community as well. Um, that's just one example, but uh, you know, it goes both ways and that should come naturally, but sometimes people need to be reminded. And a piece of research that I found really helpful to kind of navigate that this space is really we want, you know, the farmers to be leading uh, some of the changes that need to happen. And Arnstein's uh, ladder is, as well as additional research that's followed this has been really helpful for me to think about uh, navigating that space and, you know, what I, take control of as a researcher versus what I help, I'm helping farmers or other rural communities with in terms of helping them make changes themselves. And finally, be patient. Um, I showed you the timeline for a reason. This has take, been a lot of work and taken a lot of time to get to the, the successes. It, went, it didn't happen overnight. And sometimes things didn't look like they were going all that well. And uh, because of this experience, uh, you know, early on, I was thinking about some of the research as kind of one-offs. Uh, but once I started working with rural communities and really developing personal relationships with, with some of the farmers I was working with, I had a mental mindset in which uh, change, in which, uh, you know, I was no longer sort of coming to the community, but I was a part of the community. And that uh, helped me be patient. And I really think about this work as, uh, as a, almost a parent and that this is my third child. 
uh, rather than you know a typical um, research project where you write the paper and you're and you're done. It's a lifelong <laughs> venture. And I'll just close with uh, a paper that was published last year um, by an applied economist and uh, a, a team, Jill uh, Cavaglia Harris, that we published in Ecology and Society. And for those of you that are thinking that you would like to engage in this kind of, um, you know, this kind of stakeholder driven uh, and uh, great stakeholder driven and um, sort of participatory research, I encourage you to look at Jill's paper, The Six Dimensions of Collective Leadership that Advance Sustainability Objectives. And now in closing, I'd just like to um, you know, share with you that you know, I realize this is a story about Iowa. Many people on here tonight are from other places, uh, but if we take a 50,000 foot view to look at agricultural landscapes, you know, Iowa looks a lot like, you know, the Central Valley of California, another major agricultural producing region, the Argentinian Pampas, the Australian Wheat Belt, Northeast China, the Ukrainian bread basket. And so many of the challenges, uh, as well as the possibilities are, it's not only the landscape pattern that is similar, but it's also some of the challenges that op and opportunities are, are similar throughout these regions. So I hope that some of the story that I've shared with you can translate to whatever agricultural region that you're working in. And I leave you with a, a, a paraphrasing of a quote by Margaret Mead, uh, never doubt what a small group of thoughtful, committed people can do. Uh, you might just change the world. And from me, uh, you know, I think this wouldn't be possible without teamwork. So the genius in all of this work is really in the collaboration. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. That was uh, really great um, and just shows the, you know, fascinating journey from research to demonstration to adoption that, you know, we all love to sort of hear and see, but it's so hard to kind of really watch it as you have and trace it. And so I think this is, it's just fascinating to hear you, you describe, uh, you know. Uh, so um, we have, a, uh, you know, for the audience, um, if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A uh, and I'd be happy to ask them on your behalf. Um, I guess while you're waiting for that, um, I was curious now that, you know, as you look back, um, I mean, it was sort of interesting to see your your transition from uh, focusing on, you know, just the ecology to then thinking about how to make it more market based and in order to really um, maybe have wider adoption. So looking back, I mean, or as you think about it now, do you think that uh, the pace of adoption might have been uh, faster if it, if it was uh, some other type of perennial cover, if you had in fact gone for miscanthus, which you kind of said, oh, that's a heavy lift, but uh, which it is, but do you think that uh, the choice of prairie, uh, the choice of perennial cover could affect um, farmers' willingness to plant it or? Is that uh, could it go both ways? I mean, I know miscanthus is not easy to to plant either. So yeah, yeah, I think you're you're right on when you say you know it could go both ways. Um, when we were initially looking at the uh, you know designing the strips one experiment, um, I still remember the meeting. It was like November two thousand five, and we're looking at all the potential different kinds of perennial cover types we could uh, we could plant is the experiment and that we're trying to, you know, qualitatively at least, you know, check off what we thought would be different functions associated with those different perennial covers. And we dreamed big, we dreamed wild, you know, we talked about things like miscanthus, we talked about brome because, you know, that's what farmers already, you know, knew how to do and it would establish very quickly. Uh, we talked about alfalfa and we talked about uh, hazelnuts uh, again thinking about something that could provide a you know there would be a market associated with it and um, you know I think each of those would be an interesting experiment they're all very expensive to conduct um, and uh, I'm really you know in hindsight uh, we chose the right one we chose prairie um, uh, and we, the reason that we chose it is because of any of those perennial uh, cover types. Uh, we, you know, thinking scientifically, 
we wanted to be able to show a difference um, and, and show a difference in a in a in a short period of time. And uh, we think you know uh, the prairie is best able to do that uh, because of one, it's grassy cover type. Uh, two, it um, is diverse. And so with that diversity, it does well in a wet year, it does well in a dry year. And uh, so no matter what na mother nature is throwing at us, you know, there's some species that are there that do pretty well. It, you know, you, you sort of uh, guard against uh, the risk of failure uh, with the diversity. And also just the, the diversity of the roots is really important in, in providing that soil stability and, and, um, and soaking up the nutrients as well as uh, providing all the niches for, for wildlife. Um, so uh, I think we chose the right one. And mm -hmm. uh, the other piece of it is, you know, from a farming standpoint, is it the right one? Um, maybe not for everybody, right? And you alluded to that, uh, but certainly for the people that we've worked closely with, um, the, the idea of, of prairie is, is inspiring to them, right? So there's this sort of element of, of inspiration that it provides that say brome just, it just doesn't have the same <laughs> level of inspiration, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is, uh, you know, and, and I think prairie is, well, it's easy, probably the easiest among many to establish, less costly, and you don't need to learn something new um, as opposed to these other types of grasses. Um, so there's lots of advantages and I can see, see why it was, um, you know, it might have worked better than than some of the more difficult ones that that could have been chosen. So I think, uh, uh, and I guess the the other interesting thing here is is how well, you know, this is sort of a, a really a, a living experiment on how demonstrations can work, um, because um, instead of just um, either market based or regulatory you know, mandates that require farmers to do certain things. This is something that just looking at demonstration and farmers coming voluntarily to learn from, from your experiment. I think that is sort of really fascinating to watch. Um, and I'd be interested to see how this might apply to other practices that we'd like to see farmers adopt. I mean, just cover crops, for example, you know, uh, and I was wondering whether you had some thoughts on how uh, you know, what might be done? I mean, we, we know just, uh, you know, the annual cover crops, are the adoption rates are very low. And even though there's lots of benefits that we know come from those, but what might explain why, you know, some, some kind of demonstrations work, but not others? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I haven't done a lot of research on cover crops, so <laughs> I can't, uh, you know, speak to, speak to all of those points. Um, what I, what I do know is that um, you know there's there's just a lot of risks involved in in farming as you as you well know and uh, you know unless there are are mechanisms to help uh, farmers in terms of reducing those risks it's just it's really challenging to to make any kind of conservation decision and and so I'm really hopeful that some of the you know, changes at the USDA and the risk management agency will make it easier for farmers to, to adopt uh, cover crops. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that, you know, farmers who uh, are successful in using, in using cover crops, uh, you know, helping them to tell their stories um, resonates a lot uh, with, with other farmers. And uh, you know, a key piece of the, the research that I've seen here is that uh, you know, the easiest way to make cover crops pay is through you know, grazing with, a, with livestock, which really connects to that farmer you know, productivist identity. And so uh, you know, overcoming that hurdle of getting more you know, livestock producers working with, with row crop farmers through say, you know, grazing exchanges and uh, figuring out those mechanisms for um, for payment through through that mechanism will hopefully, you know, just adding one thing at a time, right, uh, can help uh, tip the balance towards more covered crop adoption. Yeah. Well. All right. Well, uh, we'll 
uh, close the session with that. So thanks again for um, you know uh, accepting uh, our invitation to present and and uh, giving us such a fascinating talk today. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, I think the talk will be posted and available to other people who could not be here today. Uh, so thanks again. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Madhu. Great opportunity. Thank you.